Hi, you're with RLP FM Health Matters, and you're chatting with Dr. Ben, and today's guest, Kate Save from Peninsula Physical Health and Nutrition. Kate, welcome to the show. Thank you. How are you? Thanks for joining us. Kate, tell us, uh, it's the start of the year. We're all excited. We're heading into 2022. Uh, we've had our Christmas parties. We've had our New Year's Eve. We've woken up New Year's Day, and we've, we've gone, that's it. This year, it's going to be different. And we've made some news resolutions. We've been chatting with friends. We've made some promises to them about how we're going to be different. We're going to eat better. We're going to think better. Uh, tell us, how to set us up for success. How do we do this well? Uh, what are you seeing out there uh, in your industry around people's New Year's resolutions? Look, I think every year people have these fantastic intentions and New Year's resolutions is a really good habit to get into because a lot of the time, by the time it gets to the end of the year, we've lost all motivation to really take care of ourselves. So setting New Year's resolutions is a really positive thing to do. However, I think it's setting your intention that has to really coincide with the New Year's resolution because a lot of people would like to achieve certain things. So, for example, they may want to lose weight or they might want to get healthy, but they don't put an action plan of what they actually need to do to achieve it. So they're, they're putting down on paper the outcome that they want, but they haven't actually thought about the plan to achieve that outcome. So that uh, taking that step to really think about what that would involve. If you need to get healthy... What are you doing that you believe is inhibiting you being healthy? And let's address that first. Mm, so set, set the intention. Go, yep, I'm gonna, this is what I'm going to do. But then put a plan into place. Yeah, and, and I guess it's really like goal setting in business. You know, you have your, your vision or your mission, and then you actually have to put together your objectives or your action plan of how you're going to achieve it. So if someone does want to, say, drop a clothing size or a belt buckle loop or just feel healthier, well, then they need to look at what they were doing last year that made them not be able to lose weight or made them feel unhealthy and start to put those things on the action list. And I must say, after two years of COVID, I've heard a lot from clients at the moment that alcohol has become a real problem in their diet and a source of not just only extra calories and extra carbs, but, but also a source of um, demotivation because we know that if we drink too much, the next day we certainly um, do not feel like getting out and doing the right thing or eating the right thing. We're far more tempted to have that greasy meal or the carby food or to skip the workout. Mm, Souvlaki after a big night, 2 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> uh, look, um, uh Alcohol, I, I hear that a lot with my patients as well. And mm. many in the new year have come to me and said, that's it. I'm never drinking again. <laughs> and as you and I know, for many of our patients, that that, that never again is a three-day stint and then they're back with another G&T. How, how do we set ourselves up for success when it comes to New Year's resolutions, particularly around food, maybe around alcohol, what what's fair and reasonable? What are the what are the steps that we could take? Even maybe the small steps we could take yeah. to have some wins. Look, the small steps or the smallest steps would be swapping your alcoholic drink to a lower calorie, lower carb version, or limiting the number of drinks. Not necessarily to zero, but limit the frequency of when you drink. So you might say, I'm going to have a little bit of two drinks whenever I drink, but I'm only going to drink twice a week instead of four to five times a week and make sure that whatever you put down in your action plan, you actually have some intention of sticking to or the thought of that change is not so overwhelming that you can't get started and I think that's where a lot of people end up. They set a goal that's so overwhelming that they never get started. So having your goal in small increments, so the first change might be if you are a GMT drinker, are you, can you swap to gin and soda water or gin and uh, no added sugar, um, lower calorie tonic? Because at least you're going to cut the calorie effect down. It doesn't, you know, negate the impact of the alcohol, which has effect in itself. But, you know, they're, they're small steps. And then it's really about the, the frequency. And I think 
staying zero or never drinking again, it's really fraught with problems because if you, if someone was to, uh, that pub test someone said to me the other day, if you told your friend or your mate or your friend over coffee, wherever you are, I'm never drinking again, would they take you seriously or would they laugh? Now, if they're laughing, then it probably means they know you too well and perhaps that's not achievable. So I, I think that you have to really think about what makes you happy, what you enjoy doing, but when does it become something that is really adverse or has adverse health effects or will limit you from achieving your goals? And and how much do you want to achieve those goals? Like, how important is that goal to you? If that goal is all or nothing, then you don't care when someone laughs when you say you're never drinking again because that goal is so important that you're going to do that anyway. And sometimes that negativity can actually fuel people to stick to their goal. Mm. Do you call it the pub test? Yeah, oh, I heard okay. that recently and I thought that's a really mm. good way of looking at it because if you can't believe yourself, then no one's going to believe you. And I think it's the way that you say it to a certain extent too because if you are really committed to the goal, you're not going to present it in a way that um, is going to have someone laugh at you. You know, if you're very mm. serious about it and you've really thought about it and you have an action plan, then you're going to tell the person this is what I'm going to do and this is how I'm going to do it. And then they'll go, hmm, that seems reasonable. So mm. Mm. Tricky to tell someone that you're not going to drink again at the pub as you <laughs> swill, swill right. your third beer yeah. down. Tell me, um, one of the things that, uh, that I often work with with clients when they do make a commitment, when they do set a goal, is to not make it forever. It's to make it, it's, it's just to commit for two weeks. Just commit for four weeks. Just commit for a week. Just say, I'm not you know, going to drink or I'm only going to limit to one drink a day or whatever it might be, and only do it for a very short period of time. And so you know it's not a forever thing. It's just for two weeks. You then get to the end of the two weeks and you go, well, you know, that was great. That, that actually felt good and I feel better. I'm going to do another two weeks and then another two weeks and maybe I'll do it then a month. Have you found that works too for clients, that they just set little small achievable goals, but in short time frames as well. That's a really interesting mindset, and I think that that would work for the majority of people. However, I also see the clients that uh, would perhaps set the goal that even that all or nothing for them seems so hard, they might be better to set a long-term goal just a reduction in what they're doing. So I think we've got to assume that everyone's different, everyone's intrinsically or extrinsically motivated. So being they either are motivated from within or they take their motivation from someone outside. And I think we need to consider how people stay motivated. So perhaps um, sticking to something for a full two weeks, um, if they need to be motivated uh, if it doesn't come from within, then they need to be surrounded by those people that are going to keep them on track, that extrinsic motivation. However, if they're internally motivated, then that's probably an easier thing to do. So, uh, yeah, each to their own, but I think that's a great suggestion because two weeks or one or two weeks in the mindset of most people, if you really want something, it's really not a lot to ask. Mm. Years of experience. Uh, with New Year's resolutions and people's decision to change their diet. Kate, what what are the top three uh, New Year's resolutions when it comes to nutrition, in your mm-hmm. experience, produce the biggest health, uh, positive positive health outcomes uh, that, that are achievable for people? What would you recommend for someone that's listening right now and they're going, yeah, I should do something? What are the top three that you would suggest that they might tackle? Look, one that I particularly like is not eating after dinner. And my reason for this is the things that you eat after 7 p.m. or 8 p.m. or 9 p.m. are definitely not coming out of the the bottom drawer in the fridge. They're not from the veggie drawer, right? They are coming from the top shelf in the cupboards or they're hidden in the back of the freezer. So I think not eating after dinner is a really good tip. And I would extend that to saying after dinner, perhaps, you know, have a very satisfying, 
healthy dinner, fill up on the low-carb veggies and salads and make sure that you are feeling full and satisfied and you've had enough protein in the meal. And then create a rule where after dinner, all you can have is herbal teas. So if you feel like a particular flavour, get a peppermint tea or a licorice tea or a lemon and ginger tea. So you're not actually putting in or you're not tempting yourself with the things that you've intentionally hidden from yourself at the top of the cupboard. So that would be my first one. Stop right there, Kate. (laughs) That, that is, wow, that is really, really good. Often we talk about the kind of food, the sugars or the fats or the alcohol, but just a time-limited change to when we eat, not what we eat. That's, that's gold. I hope everyone is picking up what Kate just put down then. Uh, <laughs> rather than change what you eat, change when you eat. Uh, gold. Number two. Number two would certainly be around uh, having the, the timing between eating over the day. So, for example, a lot of the time people will have, say they have breakfast 7, 8 o'clock before they go to work, they then get to 10, 10, 30, 11, and they're getting bored or they need to move around, so they think they need to eat again. Whereas if you've had a good, substantial breakfast, you really shouldn't be eating between your meals. So if you can extend the gap, between your eating period for four to four, five hours, then what you're actually doing is letting your body burn the calories from the food and then get into that state of mild nutritional ketosis or a fat-burning state where you start to actually use the excess calories that are stored in the body as fuel because a lot of the time we are used to just pouring calories or fuel into our body but not actually giving the body any time to burn them off. So I think not everyone can do this. A lot of people prefer very small meals and lots of snacks and they're more frequent eaters. But I personally know if I have a substantial breakfast, so I could have a couple of eggs and a bit of avocado or some good mushrooms or tomatoes or something like that for breakfast, then I definitely do not need to eat until at least... 12 or 1 o'clock at the very earliest. And that's if I've had breakfast at 6.30, 7 a.m. Now, if breakfast has even been delayed further, so if you're someone who likes intermittent fasting, perhaps you're not having breakfast till mid-morning at 11 a.m., then perhaps you're not eating again until 5 o'clock. Or, you know, so your, your gaps between your meals actually can become important for using the fuel that you've put in your body uh, as an energy source, not just topping it up and filling it up all the time. And think of it like a car, that if you just keep putting petrol in every 10 minutes, then it's just going to pour out. And in our human body, unfortunately, it doesn't pour out. It just fills up more and more and more. Wow. So the first two are not what, they're when. Yes. All right. Number three. Number three is certainly about avoiding sugar. And the reason I say this is sugar gives us pleasure so we can actually change our brain chemistry. So we get the the happiness feeling, the serotonin, the dopamine, the pleasure. And when you have too much sugar, you've got this constant stimulation and these sorts of happiness. Now, the happiness then is, is linked to this sweet taste. Instead of happiness, it can be linked to social interaction linked to, you know, reading a good book or pursuing a hobby or exercise or just actually enjoying the company you're in or enjoying the work. So if you have sugar all the time, you start to trick your brain into thinking that true happiness is this chemical feeling in your brain when you put something sweet in your mouth because it does trigger happiness. But this triggering of happiness... Uh, it, it's like there's only one spot. If you think of a game like golf, right, there's only one hole and one ball. So actually we've got sort of four different balls. One would be sunshine, one would be social interaction, one would be sex, and the other one would be sugar. And whichever one gets there first actually will fill that pleasure centre. So if we are constantly filling the pleasure centre with just sugar, then none of those other things will give us as much pleasure anymore and we become addicted to sugar above anything else. Mm. That's gold, Kate. So, yeah, And I know you are the sugar police. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now tell us, lastly, the resolutions, we don't have to do them alone. What role does a support structure, does environment play uh, in helping set us up for success? whether it might be uh, a coach, whether it might be a friend, a partner, uh, someone that we make a commitment to, 
to do whatever we want to do, what role does that play? I think having an accountability partner is essential and that's because particularly when it comes to food, we actually think about food about 300 times a day. So that's 300 good decisions you have to make every day. And if you're only holding yourself accountable, then it's pretty easy for one out of those 300 decisions to go, ah, just me, I don't matter that much, I'm I'm going to go off track. Whereas if you have an accountability partner, then at least you can say, wow, if I don't have this now, I can tell my accountability partner that I was so tempted, I even opened the fridge, I pulled out the block of chocolate, I snapped off two pieces, and then I actually walked to the bin and dropped them in the bin. And, you know, not saying you have to go to that extent, of course, but having someone that you can say, I got so close to it, who can share that journey with you as well, that can actually empathise with you and go, you know, I was the same. I got the spoon out, I opened the freezer, I was about to crack the lid off the ice cream and I thought, what am I doing? And I put the spoon back in the drawer. So you need someone who can empathise with you to help keep you accountable. Love it. Love it. And, and all of this is wrapped around, of course, taking action. So if you're listening to what Kate's just said, I'm curious, what have you picked up from what she's put down and what is the action step for you? What could you do? Uh, as we say goodbye to Kate in just a second, what could you actually do and start changing today uh, to make a difference and set yourself up for success in whatever New Year's resolution you've set? Kate, it's been fantastic again. Look forward to having you on the show again next week. Kate from Peninsula Physical Health and Nutrition, have an amazing rest of the day and look forward to catching up with you next week. Thank you very much, Ben. Have a great week. See you, Kate. 